Good evening, everyone. Welcome to New America, New York City. Um, for those of you who are new to New America, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan civic enterprise at Think Tank. Um, and my name is Georgia Levinson Cohan, and I run the program on profits and purpose at New America, which is really uh, a program that examines social entrepreneurship and social investment. So uh, I have the the all stars of, of my field here tonight. I'm, I'm thrilled. I also I don't know where Tyler went, but I want to thank Tyler Bug at New America who. Um, makes everything in New America, New York City happen. Um, and also Amory Slaughter, who's not here tonight, but who is our CEO um, and really helping to build out more programming like this in New York. So it's terrific. Um, as I said, uh, profits and purpose in it. We don't tend to think of think tanks as very entrepreneurial places, um, but this one actually is. Uh, in addition to research and writing, we also get to do a lot of really interesting and fun programming like the one tonight. And for profits and purpose, we've done uh, we've really looked at innovation, um, social innovation in the public sector. We've had um, Nick Kristoff for a few discussions. We were doing a really interesting partnership with the Museum of the City of New York, looking at um, different forms of activism, and did an event a few weeks ago on, on green, urban green innovators. Uh, but I really wanted to address the sort of social entrepreneurship and social investment topic head on, I think, in part as an excuse to get Cheryl and, and Liz um, uh, together, and we've been plotting for that for a while. And then the genesis of this panel was recently met um, Jay. Uh, and read his book and sort of said we have to connect all the dots and, and bring everyone together. And then I sort of said, and, and we really need the, the youngest face of sort of who, <laughs> who really represents um, the field today and how do we really think about social entrepreneurship and change making and, and really energizing young people um, to think about tackling some of the world's most challenging social, environmental, and economic problems. So we have. Um, we have just a terrific lineup of, uh, we're in for a real treat tonight, so thank you all for coming. Um, I will introduce everyone briefly. The bios are pretty amazing, um, but I'll give a little, a little bit of a snapshot. Um, Kareem, uh, so I'm, I, I decided to do it in newbiness order. It's sort of new to the field uh, order. So Kareem Obelnega is the, is the founder and CEO of Practice Makes Perfect and also an Echo and Green Fellow. We'll talk a lot more tonight about Echo and Green 2013. Is that right? Yeah. And the founder and CEO of something called Practice Makes Perfect. Kareem will talk much more about his work, but essentially what he's doing is addressing the achievement gap um, uh, in a number of interesting ways, but mostly focusing on one of the great disparities that has to do with summertime enrichment um, and, and really the disparities in um, summer academic programming um, between lower income and higher income peers. And he's doing that sort of a, a full-time set of summer programming that's, that's terrific and is working here um, in the US and based in New York. Uh, to his right, um, Jacob Leaf is the founder and CEO um, of the Ubuntu Education Fund, and we have uh, and a recent author of a book, um, I Am Because You Are, um, uh, of the same name, and we will have signing in, um, of the we have books in the back. Um, uh, Jake went to South Africa in the mid-1990s, uh, I think really to observe the elections, and then um, set up the Ubuntu Education Fund in 1989, and sort of didn't leave. <laughs> Um, spent, uh, spent the next 15 years or so really creating an extraordinary um, cradle to career, sort of whole child focused um, set of services uh, for, for children um, in a community, in, in the townships in Port Elizabeth, but for a community of 400,000 people. They're really serving 2,000 children very deeply and very um, intensively. Um, and like Kareem, um, Jake has, I, I won't go through them, you can see in the bios, but it's really sort of won or been recognized with every kind of young leader um, and young service award you can imagine. <laughs> um, this, is a, this is an accolade and um, recognition heavy group. Um, uh, next to Jake is Liz Luckett, who's a good friend and colleague um, and really an inspiration. Liz is, I think, not only leading but helping to define and shape the impact investing field. Uh, so Liz is the president of something called the Social Entrepreneurs Fund, which is TSEF. Um, but prior to heading TSEF, she has extensive experience in philanthropy and in business analytics um, and in technology. So her career in the private sector, um, prior to, uh, she ran impact investing um, in the Pershing Square Foundation, which is an impact uh, at philanthropy, but prior had a career at Citigroup um, and also uh, was a founder, right, and, and then vice president of Fulcrum Analytics. So essentially um, brings all of those business investing skills to her work at TSEF, um, where she's 
Liz and her team, including a pretty incredible uh, investment committee, which she'll talk more about, um, focuses on early stage equity stakes and really in, in impact companies. Um, and I'll have a, across a range of industries, and I hope you'll talk a little bit about some of those investments. And then finally, and then I'll let everyone actually speak for themselves, um, we have uh, Cheryl Dorsey, who doesn't need a whole lot of introduction, um, but I'm delighted to have a real pioneer and um, not just leader, but I think icon at this point in the field, and has really created the field of, of social entrepreneurship. Uh, Cheryl's the president of Echoing Green, um, which is a global organization which seeds and unleashes next generation talent uh, to solve Exhibit A, right? <laughs> um, to solve the world's biggest challenge through the fellowship program and others. Uh, prior to becoming <coughs> president, um, Cheryl, uh, which, it, which she assumed in 2002, said numerous leadership, entrepreneurial, um, and service roles, uh, has served in two administrations, as White House Fellow, various high level positions at the Department of Labor and elsewhere, and currently, for those of you applying, is a vice chair for the President's Commission on White House Fellowships. Um, again, very highly decorated uh, in a number of fields. I think leadership, service, medicine, I mean, you, <laughs> you name it. Um, but, I, but interestingly, was one of the, before, is the first uh, Echoing Green Fellow herself to assume to run the organization. So I think in 1992 was awarded a really interesting. 92. I'm old. I'm not that old. 1992. <laughs> 1992 <92. laughs> uh, was uh, awarded to run Family Van. Is that right? Which mm -hmm. is a community-based mobile health unit in Boston. Um, so please help me welcome the group, and then uh, have some questions, and then I will open it up to the field. So thank you all. Actually, Cheryl, if we can start with you, I would just, I would love you all to reflect a little bit, just for a few minutes, on your own stories, sort of how, and we don't have to talk about it as social entrepreneurship, we can just really think about it as change making, but how you came to the work, you do a little bit of sort of personal color behind it, and what your work looks like today. Sure. Uh, thank you guys for coming. Appreciate um, uh, you taking the time. Georgia, thank you for moderating. Um, and I'm so excited to be joined by such incredible leaders across the space of social innovation. So um, I always enjoy these opportunities. Um, you know, I think I came to this work in a fairly circuitous way. I was born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm the child of two public school teachers who taught in the Baltimore City School System for 30 years each. Um, my dad was the first person in his family to go to college. My mom was the second. Um, and living in a household with teachers, education was the instrument to um, move our family forward. Um, I and my mom ended up was a guidance counselor, so it was all about college prep all the time. Um, went off to Harvard College and um, was a pre-med student. I was the first person in my family to go to medical school, but I came of age, uh, especially in an African American family, where success was either doctor, lawyer, engineer, and we sort of had pretty you know, strict slots on what um, professional trajectory looked like. And I just didn't know much more than that, but was pretty good in math and science, so really got pushed to that track. Um, and when I was in college, it was sort of clear, or sort of clear that I didn't necessarily feel that in my heart and soul, but I just didn't know what else to do. Um, and when your whole family is like, we're going to have a doctor in the family, we're going to have a doctor in the family, <laughs> it's hard to go home and tell your family that's not what you want to do. And clearly was not courageous enough to do it because I ended up going to medical school um, and then had taken time off. Um, uh, I was at Harvard Medical School and had gotten a scholarship to go to the Kennedy School of Government and um, you know, was fortunate and open to the universe where I was um, reading the Boston Globe and they did a seminal series called Birth and the Death Zones. And it was a five part series about um, infant mortality rates in inner city Boston. At the time, black babies were dying at three times the rate of white babies, which is horrific enough. It's even worse when it's happening in the backyard of some of the world's greatest medical facilities. And to think that Boston had the third highest rate of black infant mortality in the country, only behind Washington DC and Seattle, Washington, Really interesting, right? And the first of the five-part series had a photo of a young mother um, kneeling before the grave of her baby that she had just buried. And I can still see it, and it like just makes me, I'm like tearing up even thinking about it, because she could have been my sister, she could have been my cousin, she could have been me, right? And it just didn't make sense to me, you know, how in a land of plenty, you know, two blocks away from Brigham and Women's and Mass General, this young lady had to bury her baby. It was just horrific. And it was sort of this moment of obligation where for whatever reason I just couldn't get it out of my mind. And it became sort of this 
this beautiful, awful obsession. Like I just couldn't stop thinking about it. And ended up talking about it and found my way to the woman who would become my partner, my mentor, my dearest friend, an obstetric anesthesi anesthesiologist, Nancy Oriole. And we just started thinking about this idea and sitting at her kitchen table in Cambridge with the dog barking, her kids screaming. It was just a mess. We sort of came up with this idea of like, what were we going to do about this problem? And we decided to start a mobile health unit. Doesn't seem that innovative, but at the time, the notion of um, using culturally competent services to engage people into existing services was new and sort of a new way to think about addressing racial disparities. We didn't know what we were doing. We had never run anything and never started anything. And here was this newly minted fellowship program called Echoing Green. Um, and they took a chance on me. And it absolutely changed my life and helped make me into the person uh, that I am today. And it's just one of the most transformative experiences in my life because they believed in me when nobody else did. Um, and they backed Nancy uh, and I uh, when nobody else would. So that's how I came to the work. Thank you. I have to go after Cheryl. No. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, I am a child of Jewish immigrants, but many generations later. Um, and I grew up in New York City. I, um, um, I sort of always wanted to work in, in the public sector, but uh, had a, a, a non-millennial view of, of income and felt I should pay off debts and make enough money. Um, so my first job. I actually spent all my summers working at um, the city council president, the borough president of New York City, um, who many of you may or may not remember was little, I, I won't say his name. Um, but I got to work in the ombudsman office, which was really an exciting place to work uh, because you sat, it was essentially the precursor to 311, and you sat at the front line of all the inbound calls and people walking in um, with every problem you can imagine. And I was 15, 16, 17 years old um, and got to spend time sort of solving problems for people in New York. And that was a great experience and sort of transformative for me. Um, and I do remember one time a woman calling me with dimes a while ago um, from a payphone um, that she was her boyfriend was going was was beating her up and she had been running around trying to find a women's shelter they were all full and she um, couldn't get in anywhere and it was too late to get a court injunction so I was trying to solve this problem at you know 17 and I um, managed to get the Red Cross to take her for the night. So she kept calling me in between phone calls. I talked them into taking her, even though it wasn't a fire or a natural disaster. They agreed to give her one room for that night. And I remember just thinking, I solved a problem. I can't believe it. Um, anyway, so that it's interesting because now a lot of our investments really sit at that intersection. They really sit in the middle of um, making services more accessible for uh, underserved populations. And you know, a lot of the social services of available to people are very difficult to access, and that is one of our favorite investment areas. Sure. So I was 13 years old, and I moved to London. I'm American, and started to get into a lot of trouble. It was a big city. I come from a suburb around here. And one day, I stumbled upon this march in Hyde Park, which was a Free Mandela march. And for whatever reason, with no connection to South Africa, I was captured by it, the music, the sound. I started volunteering. And then when I was 17 in 1994, they were taking 15 of us from 15 different countries down to observe the country's transition to democracy. And we spent six weeks meeting with everyone from your Robert Island freedom fighters through to your uh, Eugene Tarablanche, your right-wing neo-Nazis, and everyone in between. And um, one evening, we were in a place called Alexandria, which is all shacks. It sits in the shadows of Santon, which is a um, sort of the economic hub of the entire continent. And it's in the middle of Johannesburg, skyscrapers like Lower Manhattan. And I meet this woman, and you're 17, you know everything, you're very confident, and she's telling me how she waited uh, 30 hours to cast her ballot, and I'm saying, I she was quite big, she was uh, quite old, and I'm like, I don't understand, what do you mean? And she's like, you don't understand, and she tapped me on my shoulder and said, I've been waiting 85 years, and walked away. And I grew up in a home with two parents who both went to university and had a lot of privilege, and. I just never thought about freedom and democracy and these concepts. And uh, the next day, I heard a woman speak who was working on a new constitution there. She was a law professor at Penn in Philadelphia. And I was like, this is my ticket back. And so a year later, I end up at UPenn. And I go find this woman. And she wanted nothing to do with an 18-year-old. Mm -hmm. And um, I bugged her and bugged her. And we became friends. 
and we just got internet on our campus and I found a job down in South Africa and so I convinced her to sponsor me for six months. I get down there and of course there was no job, I was scammed. And I didn't know what to do so I got on a train headed out of Cape Town and about uh, 18 hours into this train ride I struck up a conversation with a guy who invited me to get off in a place called Port Elizabeth which is a very industrial port town on the Indian Ocean side. It's, uh, I always say it's a place people leave, they don't go to. And this guy it was a black South African who said, well, come in the townships, have a beer with me. And on the surface, it was in 97, I symbolized everything wrong in the country. Um, I went with him and it was, you know, went to this little bar, which is a shack, basically, and the place went silent, was seen out of a movie, everyone looks at me, and one guy in the corner motioned me over. And I sat with him, and he was a school teacher, and I was a entrepreneur. I was not, had nothing to do with nonprofit education. It was never going to be a career. And, he said, why well, you work in my school? I said, okay, but I need a place to live. And I moved with his family that night. Now, I probably I spent the next six months with his family living in this community. I definitely overly romanticized the poverty, but those six months shaped my whole view and development. I, a lot of money was pouring into the country, um, post-apartheid philanthropic money, a lot of huge organizations that we all know um, from around New York, D.C., EU, and everyone was coming into the country and through these communities we were, I was living in and defining success by how many classrooms they built, how many libraries they put out, and so forth, and they'd move on. And I kept, I look at these kids, these little girls have been raped or living in a shack and thinking, the country's saying apartheid's over, you can do whatever you want, you go to university. And these organizations say, look at all the great work we're doing, but everyone's defining success purely by these outputs. And I knew I didn't get to where I was with a wind-up computer and a cup of soup, and it takes a huge investment. So I said, let's start our own organization that would not work with the top academic kids, but the bottom of the bottom of the kids. So we decided we'd start with kids who've been raped or lost their parents. If we invested in them the same way someone invested in me, could we get them out of uh, poverty? And that was 17 years ago. So I started this on the Penn campus just when I was 21 with these two credit cards away on this call. I don't know if anyone remembers, but I took eight of them and started Ubuntu. <laughs> so that's the journey. That's awesome. <laughs> So my story started with my parents, and both of my parents are Egyptian immigrants. They came to the U.S. to start a family and provide them with a better life, the traditional like immigrant story. Um, unfortunately for us, my father passed when I was a lot younger. I was one of five. My brothers and I wound up selling candy on school nights and weekends just to make, help, make ends meet. Um, and then by virtue of just growing up in a low-income neighborhood, we went through some of New York City's most struggling public schools. I had 60 absences in seventh grade because I wasn't engaged and I feel like going to school. My dad didn't graduate from high school in Egypt. My mom had only finished high school in Egypt. And now they were in a new country and didn't really understand the educational experience here. And so there's never any pressure to really go to school or do well in school or use that as an avenue for success after. Um, I wound up going to my local high school. My high school had a 55% graduation rate. 20% of the kids there were college ready. 10% probably matriculated and graduated from four-year schools. Um, I didn't think of those as disparities or inequalities at the time I was going through it. Um, and I was fortunate that a series of nonprofits and mentors kind of stepped into my life and ultimately changed my life prospects. Um, wound up going to Cornell, graduating in the top 10% of my class. Um, and in the process of being at Cornell, um, I ran across a scholarship that was supposed to help me fund my education. The United Negro College Fund at the time said that they'd give $10,000 to any student who can come up with a solution for the achievement gap that involved corporate intervention. And as you can imagine, I was 17. I knew nothing about the achievement gap, and I knew nothing about how corporations work, but obviously wanted $10,000 from Cornell. Um, and so you start to learn. And up until that point in my life, I was a very rugged individualist. I felt like the kids who worked hard were the ones who were going to make it, and the ones who didn't are the ones who aren't. And I had my older brother as my prime example. He didn't wake up early to go to school. He didn't stay up late to do his homework. It was no surprise when he dropped out of a two-year college. It just made sense. And then I started to think back to a lot of the sociological influences. Had it growing up in a single parent household, being raised on government aid, or hanging out with the kids we hung out with, who didn't value education, influenced the way, or that ro its role in our lives. And we all know today, if something's important, it gets priority. If it's not, we just discard it, and we don't pay any mind or attention. And in that moment, I began to empathize a lot more with the situation. Um, so I didn't win the scholarship, but the numbers to me weren't just numbers. They were real people. Um, I wasn't an economist sitting there. It was the kids in my own neighborhood, the kids I played football and basketball with in high school. And in my own household, my one-year-old brother at the time my father passed away, who was still growing up and going through our system. So when you grow up poor, you obviously want to be rich and got involved with a nonprofit where I got a mentor. And the mentor was like, listen, you're hardworking. Um, you should go into financial services, a Wall Street to serve the route. So I did my internships at Goldman Sachs and at BlackRock. Um, simultaneously, my sophomore year started a nonprofit to kind of pay it forward. 
Um, and I didn't start with the intention of building a nonprofit or an organization. I was really committed to making a difference in my neighborhood. Um, nonprofit just happened to be the tax structure that was going to help us achieve that goal or mission. Um, and ever since then, it's been an uphill like battle to try and change the system that we're in. Um, I picked summer because they say that two thirds of the achievement gap can be directly attributed to unequal summer learning opportunities. And frankly, our summer school system is broken. Um, and there's an opportunity to redesign and reimagine that and start to build traction and bring in a whole new group of like investors and people behind this like vision of trying to create equity over the summer. Thank you. That, that's terrific. So, um, so one thing that's very clear in, in each, so we have four amazing individuals, but everyone's been very clear that their journey here has involved a lot of other people and organizations and mentors along the way. And one, in putting together this panel, I also realized that all of you intersect with some other of you in your work in some way, not 100 you know, but they're very nice connections. So um, Cheryl, maybe I'll start back with you again. I'd love you to just reflect on either who, in, in, uh, you know, seated here in terms of their work and or other individuals and organizations as you are, as you run Echoing Green and you're building this field. Um, how do you think about your work in relationship to others and how do you draw on others for support? Well, maybe I'll just sort of use my uh, colleagues here on the panel because I think it illustrates so beautifully how the social entrepreneurship ecosystem is structured and is growing and changing. So um, I've learned so much about impact investing by working with um, Liz and tapping into all that she knows about this space. So interesting, like Equine Green was founded, you, the real pioneers here are the founders of General Atlantic private equity firm. They founded Equine Green in 1987. As best I can tell, it was the second or third earliest founded social entrepreneurship funder in this country and really has been one of the pioneers. And when you look at um, everything we funded, we funded 640, 650 social entrepreneurs working all over the world. We really are best in class angel investors of next gen social entrepreneurs, early funders of Teach for America, City Year, Michelle Obama got money from Echoing Green, really extraordinary array of next gen leaders like Kareem. But prior to 2006, literally all of the business plan submissions we saw were of uh, next-gen leaders starting pretty traditional not-for-profits. And then all of a sudden, in 2007, like 15% of the submissions were suggesting either a for-profit social entrepreneur or a hybrid, nonprofit, for-profit combination. Every year it's ticked up to the point that this year 50% of our submissions are suggesting double bottom line or triple bottom line businesses. And I think it's an interesting phenomena that all of these young leaders are recognizing there is simply not enough philanthropic capital to solve our social and environmental problems at scale. And until you tap the capital markets, we're not going to get anything. And in some ways, the hallmark, the sine qua non of social entrepreneurship is the blurring of sectoral boundaries. Let's get out of our silos, public sector here, business here, social sector here. Nope, these guys are completely disrupting um, the rules and the way that we think about cross-sectoral sec fertilization. So the impact investing phenomena is really easy. Jacob is another example of these incredible next-gen leaders who are global citizens of the highest order. I'm the oldest one on this panel. I you know, didn't come of age with tech. Um, I did my thesis on a typewriter with whiteout. Like that's how far back I go, right? But you guys are global citizens of the highest order. And we have seen a market uptick in the number of social entrepreneurs who are focused on global issues. Like literally 50% of our deal flow this year came out of Africa. Fascinating. It's our fastest growing um, market in terms of next gen thinking, leadership. And they're a really interesting group of young leaders. Uh, when you look at the number of for-profit submissions, African-based entrepreneurs, about 46% of their proposals were suggesting for-profit or hybrid submissions versus only like 27% of those working domestically. A really interesting phenomena that the belief that business is going to drive social change. I think that's an interesting global phenomena. And then Kareem, it's just fascinating. Like again, in, uh, in my day, again, there were very sort of traditional pathways to pedigree and accomplishment and achievement doctor, lawyer, engineer. And like the fact that Kareem came out of Cornell University, so incredibly sought after. You know, the financial services guys are kicking themselves that they couldn't get him. But for you, there is a life of achievement and leadership um, that has a cachet that didn't exist in my generation. So this next gen millennial bubble that believes that doing good and doing well are synonymous and conflated, I think is really exciting. And I think everyone, all of these guys represent that in some way, shape or form. I totally agree. I actually think there's enough philanthropic capital out there. Um, 
I think too often, listen, we're seeing more and more of these hybrid models and they're terrific and yeah. a lot of ways I wish I had developed that. Yeah. However, I see every year we've been involved, the philanthropic pool of money, just say South Africa alone or globally or even here domestically has increased. Yeah, the issue is that there's incredible mediocrity and I don't think there's Great. this healthy relationship between the funding community and the practitioners and not sure. the organizations and this idea that we none of us can accomplish anything in a 12 month grant cycle. Most of what we're all doing doesn't work. If all we were, you go to Davos, you go to a Clinton Global Initiative and stand up there, if everyone's doing half what they said, there would be, there'd be no poverty. <laughs> so true, so true. And so how can we create an environment that would allow for um, a healthier discussion, allow for more risk, allow for um, a longer term commitment? Um, and that's really, I think, um, where I'm seeing a lot of, you know, my personal passion now is how can we um, encourage philanthropists to commit in the long term. Let's measure these organizations to measure the success sort of against where they've come from, not against where they're going. Um, and understand that a lot of the organizations, whether it's Kareem's doing what we're doing, we can only control what we can control. I can work with a kid from, you know, we start with pregnant mothers now, ensure a healthy birth and take them through. Work with a child for 16 years and this child, uh, was 17 years old, she went to a, um, a tavern place and she was raped. And a donor of mine said, to, oh, she was 18, she just started her first year of college, and a donor of mine said to me, what was she doing there? I'm like, what were you doing at 18 years old? Yeah. It wasn't this young girl's fault. Right. And we have to create a health, just a healthier, I think, discussion between the funding community and the practitioners. Um, however, I do also believe in everything you're doing, what you're doing as well. I'm just saying, I do think there's an incredible amount of philanthropic money out there, um, and it's, I don't think it's being invested wisely. That's true. Let's get you, you having worn both hats and sort of gotten some of the same issues, but at a major foundation and, and now also really looking at um, for profit companies. Could you comment a little bit on the, the different roles and, and sort of what you look for now as opposed to what you looked for? Yeah, um, so I think this is, you know, this is a really difficult question to answer, obviously. Um, there's a great deal of subjectivity involved in measuring impact and measuring philanthropy um, and what resonates with people. So, um, and I think that's true both philanthropically and in the investment side. When you're talking about impact, you you're often um, have to concede that there's a great deal of subjectivity around what people view as impactful. But if you were looking at a continuum of impact, because people are often saying, well, let's just, let's just divide the world into impact the way we look at risk, and let's assign various kinds of returns associated with that, that level of impact. And if you were looking at a continuum, you'd never agree at the middle. There's no way you know that I, you could say that I think investing in a um, saving baby seals and you'd like to help the homeless and I, you know we can talk about the relative value you'd probably win but anyway that you know that um, it's very subjective but on the outside I think you can agree so I think at the very clearly human rights and disaster relief are things that are 100% impactful most people can agree on that and they agree that that is the the, the realm of philanthropy there's no money to be made in human Human rights really or in sending money after an earthquake. On the other side of that continuum there's there's impact and there there's these great efficiencies which people are calling impact investments like eBay, Etsy, Uber, all of these vowel companies are um, have created efficiencies in markets that have created impact. I mean you can now um, create uh, jobs from people who are homebound. You can, for disabled people, can get a taxi without having to go anywhere. There are definitely um, disadvantaged groups that are benefiting from these efficiencies. But I would say that is the outer realm of what you would define as impact. So our investment strategy is really coming in from there a little and looking at efficiencies in markets that around um, that are intentionally designed for disadvantaged or um, underserved communities. And so we look at. Um, at creating those efficiencies, access to services, access to products that are targeting low income or prisoners or emerging markets and, and trying to make sure that those efficiencies are underwritten to get to those people. Um, so I, in the middle are the companies that are hitting break even. This concept of operational self-sufficiency comes up a lot in nonprofits now. Um, a lot of um, high net worth individuals or ultra high net worth individuals um, 
made their money in the capital markets and look at that kind of efficiency. They're very scrutinizing of um, nonprofits and saying, look, you, you've built this organization. How much are you paying people? What do you spend on lunch? You know, they're sort of scrutinizing the way you run the organization. So it, it gives a disproportionate amount of scrutiny to nonprofits that are not necessarily given to for profits. Um, and I think that middle ground of hitting operational self-sufficiency for a nonprofit where some of their money is coming from earned revenue is sort of the golden ring for nonprofits now. People like um, Donors Choose is one that comes to mind, which is, a, you're probably familiar, but it's an online uh, community where you can go, public school teachers post whatever they need for their classrooms and you can go online and fund them. Um, every dollar that you give about I think it's now down to 14 cents goes to overhead, and that's it. They don't fundraise, um, and every year they lower by you know, growing the scale of their business. They lower the amount of overhead um, for each donation. People love that model. It took them 10 years to get there, but they, they really did a great job building that organization, um, and now it's held up for a lot of other organizations as, as sort of what you're trying to achieve. So I think that continuum is a good way to think about the space of, of sort of 100% um, nonprofit, and then the potential for investing in something that could be very profitable. And in the middle are these nonprofits that are viewed as hybrids but are um, registered as 501c3s. Okay, great. Thank you. And, I, and I want to come back to the sort of overhead and general capacity building question and what that costs. But in the, in the, I also wanted, Kareem, just to ask you you're sort of still in somewhat of a startup mode, and clearly, even just to become an Equity Green Fellow, you're the, you're asked, you know, what is your impact going to be and how are you going to measure it? And as you think about the work you're doing, you said, well, you know, we just happen to be sort of registered as a 501c3, not, not the for-profit, non-profit question, but what do you really think about in terms of your longer-term outcomes and how you demonstrate success towards those outcomes? Well, it's funny. I think the social entrepreneur starts out of frustration, um, whereas your for-profit entrepreneur in most cases starts out of opportunity. Um, there may be some overlap there. Um, and I can tell you, I remember my senior year, I was thinking about, you know, do I go into the for-profit space and work in financial services, or do I work on my nonprofit? I wasn't sitting there and thinking about what the impact investor was going to look at at the end of the day. Um, I sort of looked at the education reform landscape and saw that so many of our most admirable reformers, people like Wendy Kopp or Arnie Duncan, Diane Ravitch, even President Obama, I was like, these are all incredibly admirable people, but not one of them has ever been to or through an inner city public school. And so when you talk about first-hand perspective, I just felt like it wasn't there. So much of our reform was driven from this outside looking in perspective instead of an inside looking out. And so I wasn't sitting there thinking about how am I going to measure the impact of the work I'm going to have or the kids that I'm going to be serving. Um, we kind of then have to evolve and shape shift so that we can meet those different criteria to get that funding. Um, and I think really early on, it's being able to have that flexibility without compromising what you really need to work on. And it is finding the right partners um, so Echo and Green was one of those partners for us, um, and that's been a blessing and an opportunity in, a, in and of itself, like having access to that alumni network. Um, I then got involved with an incubator called B-Space, and I remember my post-senior like senior year, maybe the first week or two out of school, I had mentored a kid and helped him get into Cornell, and I was having a like, pre-freshman like, discussion with him. And I was like, you need to take this class and that class. Don't take that professor. She sucks. Join this club. <laughs> this is where you need to get your internship. And at the end of that discussion, I sort of found myself sitting there and thinking, like, where is my pre-freshman business startup mentor um, to make sure that I don't make the same mistakes that I could potentially make? Um, and I remember reaching out to B-Space and the incubator I was in. Um, I was lucky enough that they uh, <laughs> found Jake. They were like, hey, we know this awesome kid out of UPenn who started a nonprofit 15 years ago and can relate to everything that you're going through. And we'll see if he's interested in mentoring you. Um, and Jake has been an advisor and a friend for the last two years. Um, so yeah, I think early on, less so, you're thinking about that market impact. Um, I think by the nature of our organization and the fact that I had this like business background, we started building a hybrid. Per, um, and I say we didn't start a nonprofit for the sake of starting a nonprofit because I think you start with your mission first and your goal. And then you sort of work backwards and figure out what legal structure you need to be able to carry that out. And if it is a nonprofit, there tends to not be a market. If it's a hybrid, maybe there's something in between. Um, and if there is a market, you should definitely be a for-profit in that case. Um, so now it's figuring out how do you tell the story that you need to elevate your impact and take it to the next level. So I want to ask your mentor to, to your right. So, he, so um, Jacob, one of the things you do 
really well in the in the book is you talk you, you actually push but I think you know with 15 plus years experience now in a field you sort of really talk about impact and scale and the choices that you've made to go sort of very deep um, in the lives of a smaller number of, of children and families and, and remain in one community rather than, um, and I, I imagine that you shared that, that, that viewpoint, you know, where you might be getting advice from others that sort of say, this is how you get to scale, and scale means this, and this is how you measure impact. And, um, and it, I know you, you have some different views that aren't always, um, that buck the general wisdom a little bit on this, and I'd love you to just talk sure. about that a little bit. So one of my greatest achievements was getting cremated at Washington, D.C. <laughs> And so they no, but I think it's going deeper into one area. I, um, so when I started this, there was uh, very few opportunities. My college advisor said to me, what are you really going to do after the summer? Um, social entrepreneurship wasn't a word used on campuses yet across America. Um, and I didn't really know what I was doing. And as we started to grow, I realized to get the credibility to play with the big boys, I need to design programming that would that have loud numbers, big splashes. So we designed really output-driven programming. And before I knew it, the money flooded in. Huge money. We raised eight, nine million bucks a year. A lot of, you could do a lot of work in South Africa with that. And I was getting invited to all the place, all these, I was getting all the awards and accolades. And then I um, was at this PEPFAR conference, which is a US government initiative to, um, under President Bush, to allocate enormous billions of US dollars to, to address HIV across um, Sub-Saharan Africa and Haiti. And uh, we had a group, and we were of uh, probably the top health um, professionals in the country and around the world, from Hopkins, Harvard. And we spent an entire week in the Pretoria um, discussing what could have been anything but human beings. We dehumanized it so much with our outputs and this and that. And I started to realize that you know, they, PEPFAR was giving us over a million bucks a year. They'd show up once a quarter and say, hey, great news, I got another 300,000 bucks for you. All you have to do is go do X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, well, that's not what we do. And it was killed. We called it, it was, we called the drug money. It was exciting. It was sexy. And I realized is raising children, it's not scalable, unfortunately. What worked for you didn't work for you and doesn't work for you. It's terribly individualized. And so we started with grade eights. And I'll never forget the mentor of mine, Jeff Canada. And I was, I had one of these days when I was going to pull my hair out. And I was at Harold Children's Zone. And he said to me, let me show you something. He walks me over to his clinic. He says, take a look. I said, OK. And he says, I said, are these your high school girls? And he goes, no, these are my moms. And they're all 16, 17. He's like, if you don't start with pregnant mothers, there's no point. In, you're just not going to be able to. It's too late in the game. And that's really how we started to buck that trend of going to scale. And you know, I don't think as a sector we own, we, we undermine ourselves. We, you know, If you were starting a for-profit initiative, you would talk so much about what does your investor portfolio look like? Who do you want investing in you? We don't do that. We just accept the money and run in every direction. And so we started to say to ourselves, how do we weed ourselves from an eight, nine million dollar, ten million dollar organization? And we brought ourselves down to where we're doing better work today with five and a half million dollars a year in South Africa than we did with nine million dollars. We have investors who actually are in it for the long term. And we we're a happy organization. We're doing really solid work. We can prove it. Um, the, the, I loved what you said, some of those questions. I mean, my favorite is, Jake, we love what you're doing, but how can you reach more kids for less money? And I use that. No, it's not, I use that all the time because think about that question. Like, you don't ask that with your own children, right? You say, how can I give my kid the best? You know, you don't say, well, you need glasses. Well, I'm not a vision parent. No, you're not a vision organization. You buy them glasses. <laughs> And so uh, we're not, we don't think that everyone wants to be speaking on a big innovation. We think it's an old recipe. It's how do you raise children? You give them what kids all around the world deserve, and that's everything. And you stick with them through the tough times, the bad times, and then it doesn't always work. But you try your best. And that's, so that's how we looked at scale, going deeper uh, as opposed to more kids. So Liz, I'm going to ask you a related question. And Cheryl, I'd love you both. So, you, so you're both in the business of identifying Entrepreneur, you know, entrepreneurs with a lot of potential, and then giving them a lot of what they need to sort of take off. And how how do you wrestle a little bit with with some of these tensions between um, recognizing that ultimately you do want to get costs? To, you know, you, you don't want to, you can't be profligate and wasteful, and people actually can't you can't invest in bad things. Um, but also knowing that people may need you know, in startups, for profit startups, you know, they may need some resources um, that are a little counterintuitive. Uh, to get going to ultimately be successful, whether it's for-profit or non-profit? Yeah. Um, it, it, it's 
These are difficult questions. Um, I, I'd say two examples come to mind. One is um, I'm on the board of Root Capital, which is a 15-year-old organization that sort of pioneered um, lending to agricultural cooperatives, mostly starting with coffee and then expanding. Um, and what's interesting about them is they, they, you know, their product is debt. They lend money and they do receivables lending against um, forward uh, contracts with people like Starbucks and Green Mountain Coffee. Um, you know, for 10 years they had 99% repayment rates in Latin America and then East Africa, um, and then started to expand. So they had the same thing. They started getting a lot of you know wealthy investors, donors saying, "Look, you know, you're making 12, 13% on these loans. You should you, first of all, you should be for profit. But if you're not going to be for profit, you should grow. You should you know solve this problem, reach everybody. Most of the world's poorer farmers lend money to all of them. So they tried to grow, and they tried to grow really quickly. And they moved into West Africa, and they moved into places they hadn't been, and they started lending against um, nuts and and cocoa and mangoes and Haiti, and they sort of started expanding all over to solve everyone's problem at the same time. And as you can imagine, that doesn't go so well. And then they realized, well, we can't sort of make everybody happy. Some people want us to scale. Some people want us to stay in one product, though it's coming. They did such a good job that they crowded in the industry. And so you had all these other people investing. And so now it's, they were losing these loans to people lending much larger organizations at 9% or 8% um, with the ability to lose money and, and you know just sustain the losses for several years on much bigger balance sheet. Um, what's interesting about that organization, the reason I bring it up, is is you know they could they could grow and they could also become profitable and they could even become a for profit were they to go upscale so were they to stop going to the very most remote places of the world on the very longest bus rides um, to the most saddest farms you really have ever seen where there seems to be no water and no fertilizer and very poor seeds. Um, you know, if they didn't go to those places and offer them something, they would make more money. They could go to the ones in the Monsanto supply chain or in the, you know, in some of the ones that are much larger with a lot more contracts. So keeping to their mission was what they did, and they scaled back and they started not taking that kind of money. And they said, "This is our mission. We're not going to hit operational self-sufficiency at 100%. We're actually going to keep lending to the people we know and keep doing it the way we know how." Um, but sitting in those board meetings is interesting because you've got people who really understand debt and you have people who come from ag lending and nonprofits and those board conversations are really at the very essence of what everyone's talking about which is this is the soul of our organization it's what we built it's what will probably make them go down in history and here are the people saying but your risk portfolio is getting more risky and you're you know you're you're um, you're, you know, charging less every year, and that doesn't work over time. So those are the right. That's the right conversation. You have to have a real product, and you have to stay true to your, to what you care about. So that that's one I think illustration where I see it in those board meetings. The tension between the two. Um, one of our investments in our portfolio is a company called Pigeon Lee, which is a um, started by a former inmate. He spent five years in federal prison for selling marijuana. Um, and while he was in prison, he made friends with a white collar criminal, started writing a business plan. Um, and um, uh, he, he realized while he was there that he was trying to call his girlfriend and his family. And it was about $50 for 10 minutes on the phone. So there's a terrible extortionary thing going on where um, a couple companies own the rights to use, use the phone in, in federal prisons and, and state prisons, and it's prohibitively expensive. So this is one of the reasons that when people get out, they have no connections. They have nowhere to go. They couldn't afford to really stay in touch. So he decided to solve this problem. He built, um, he, he built this inmate API where he now scrapes all the federal prisons and knows where everyone is, which is kind of cool. So he's, um, people are transferred all the time without any acknowledgment. You don't have to let your family know when I move you to Texas. Or, um, so he now knows where everyone is. And he does direct mail. And he sends them notes and says, listen, you know, welcome to Texas. <laughs> um, and um, he gives people, he's built a voice over IP call. So every call now is local, and he caps it at about $10 a month. So you can make basically the amount of minutes you're allowed as an inmate. He, he can't 
can't overcharge for that anymore. So wherever you are, he sends you that phone number, and then you can let your family know. So he's building this wonderful, um, w with great insight and great um, sensitivity to the population he's addressing, where many of the for-profit inmate um, businesses are not quite so sensitive to that population. He's selling directly to inmates and he's keeping very um, uh, focused on the mission. And so the, the way that this company will scale and the way it will remain true to that mission is keeping him as the CEO. Um, he has a super majority on the board, which means that he'll always be able to outvote the investors, which most of the investors feel is the right way to go because none of us can really have the insight he has. Um, as he reminded me when he changed his logo and I said, I like the other logo better, he said, you're not the target audience. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> anyway, um, so I think that's just an example of governance being one place where you can maintain your mission in a for-profit company. Um, Cheryl, do you, I, I have actually another question for you if we can, um, uh, and then, I'll, then I'll open it up. Um, so Cheryl, I think it was on, on your bio on the Echoing Green page, you sort of end with this career, this life question that you have, which is, what would you attempt to do if you could not fail? Um, which is tremendously inspiring um, and uh, horizon opening to some extent. Um, but there's also, interestingly, a lot of discussion in this sector now about what failure really means um, and that, in fact, uh, you know, if you're in Silicon Valley or you have a portfolio of companies, you fully expect and hope and celebrate those failures. And, and that, but that feels a little bit different um, when you're reporting, when you're nonprofit and you're reporting to funders. And um, Jake, you talk about this too. So Charlie, I'd love for you to talk about how you start to think about failure, something that we learn from and course correct from and we can speak very candidly about, um, or is something that this as a sector is still evolving as an issue. Yeah, I think that's such an important point that we don't talk enough about failure. So that, what would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail is a Robert Schuller quote. And I have a paperweight that sits on my desk. Um, and it's sort of a reminder um, that we need to do more in our sector to not only tolerate failure, but to celebrate it and embrace it. Um, I sort of feel, especially with the younger generation, there's such shame attached to failure. Instead of recognizing it as sort of experiential and a wonderful learning opportunity, people feel ashamed of it. They think it means something inherent about them, as opposed to, wow, OK, I pressure tested something. I didn't, didn't work, so now I course correct. So at Equine Green, we're sort of very deliberate to talk about it um, you know we've got sort of a whole rubric around you know how do we select these amazing next-gen leaders like Kareem right and we've got uh, you know one of the qualities we look for is resilience because we know you're gonna fail I mean that's just part of the entrepreneurial journey and it's not about when you fail or how you fail um, it's just how you're gonna get up once you fall down and keep going and that's what we're looking for so I think that's the first thing and then secondly I mean I think the real value add of Equine Green we don't give a lot of money but it's more about sort of being embraced by this peer-to-peer -peer community Community. So you're now on this journey with a whole bunch of other like-minded folks. So the ability of you all to sort of share lessons learned, no need to reinvent the wheel, but also to be held up when you fail, um, but to share the learnings and to sort of work your way through it. Um, years ago, he hasn't come to our conferences recently, but the former head of Public Allies, Paul Schmitz, a wonderful social entrepreneur, used to come and always do the most highly rated session at our New Fellows Conference. And it was always like the 10 you know, dumbest mistakes I made. And it was sort of a picture of him in a dunce cap, and he literally would walk through slide by slide. And it was so awesome because to these young startup social entrepreneurs, Paul Schmitz, like running one of the largest social enterprises, the one that, you know, Michelle Obama started in Chicago, it was a big deal for him to stand in front of them and say, oh gosh, let me share with you how I stumbled. And boy, I totally goofed on that, but here's how I thought about it. And it's such a freeing experience. Um, and it's something we try to think a lot about. Um, and I think there is always that tension like, well, you know, the work that folks are doing, it's about sort of working with um, constituents and it's really life and death stuff, so can you afford to fail? But I think when you come at the work from a position of trust and dignity and respect, nobody expects anybody to be perfect, but you're in conversation together and you're trying to figure it out. So I think people have a lot of grace if you show up and say, I might not know anything or everything, but I know a little bit of something, and together we're going to try to figure it out. So I think that's the kind of culture we try to you know, create. I think perception is very different, though, in the nonprofit space. 
And the one example I always go back to is um, during our first year, we got a $100,000 grant from um, the Pershing Square Foundation, actually. $10,000 is earmarked for the curriculum. I had hired our first employee at the time, and I was like, hey, listen, here's $10,000. Like, get the curriculum done, pretty much. Um, and I just want to see the final product. Um, so he comes back to me at the time. This is before I became a management expert. Or <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he's like, hey, listen, I got two people. I'm going to hire them as subcontractors. I'm going to pay them like $3,000 each. And then I'm going to incentivize them with a trip to the Bahamas. And I'm going to come under budget by $2,000. <laughs> and I'm like, sure, go for it, right? Like, why not? And he's like, for-profit companies do this all the time. And I was talking to one of my other friends. And I was like, hey, this is, this is what's going on. And he goes, Kareem, do you remember when we were in our training in financial services? And they said, um, how would you feel if this sort of popped up on the front cover of the Wall Street Journal? <laughs> and you should always ask yourself that question. <laughs> And in that moment, I realized that had that come up on the front cover of the Wall Street Journal, they wouldn't talk about the nonprofit executive who saved $2,000 in the curriculum or came under budget. They'd talk about the nonprofit executive who's misusing donor funds and flying or sending a trip to the Bahamas. And so perception in this space is still very different. We canceled the trip, obviously. We paid the, the subcontractors a little bit more. And we came at budget. Um, and so there's still a lot of area for improvement and work. And I don't, I use that example to be really funny in some cases, but at the same time, just to show that, you know, it, it isn't always about the most effective use or efficient use of resources in this space. Um, as a donor, you should care about getting the best product done in the time that needs to be done, not so much how the money's being spent. We don't ever chase the for profit and ask them what they did with their trip. Um, you just care that they came under budget in that case. And I think there's just certain things that you still can't do in the nonprofit space. Well, every day we're asked, I mean, uh, I love that story, but every day we're asked, well, how much are you spending on your staff salaries this year? Well, how much are you, what's your overhead? You know, that's a business decision. That's a line item. Ask me, if, am I achieving what I've said I'm going to achieve? And I said, uh, um, you know, and we, that's, that's changing the conversation. And, and I really put the blame a lot more on the nonprofit sector that we need to stop undermining ourselves. We need to take back this, create a stronger, more cohesive voice. And we're all out there defending ourselves um, individually. We need to come together and create some sort of platform where we can be in a stronger. I mean, I actually blame a lot of Northern California. I mean, you got, I raise a lot of money out there. And everyone's talking about all their startups that never made it. If I tell one person about like uh, something in one pilot initiative I, that they didn't make it, I lose my funding from them. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Uh, Liz, actually, and then I'll open up to the floor. So you, so you deal, your, your investment community, you deal with investors who in their day job actually do presumably have that mindset, which is, you know, we hit one out of the park, but the, you know, but the rest, we sort of, they're baking into their larger portfolio. And do they bring that same you know, intellectual honest about sort of risk return to the discussions and, or, or let me rephrase, if there are other comments that you want to, I mean, I'm, I'm just yeah. wondering how much that really translates. Um, I'd say the only thing ultra high net worth individuals have in common is that, um, <laughs> um, you know, first of all, w whether they earn their money or inherited it is a huge difference. And then, and then whether, um, I think they all feel a great burden of, um, Philanthropy. They feel very, all of these people are extremely philanthropic, but feel that if anything happens to them or their money, these causes, you know, if I'm funding your school and I'm your biggest donor and I run out of money, that's a huge burden to think that your school would shut. So I think that is something I see as a theme among them. In terms of their risk return, it's really individual. And that's what's so interesting about the collaborative nature of our fund is that we have that conversation together and somewhat of a Jeffersonian investment club because we have a bunch of very um, successful people in their day job trying to figure out where the intersection between philanthropy and investing lies and where their comfort level is with it. So a lot of what we're doing here in their mind is exploring that. You know, the amount of money here at stake for them is not make or break. So they're really interested in putting it to work and figuring out what happens. You know, let's figure it out. Is it is it like venture returns? Is it um, is it like philanthropy, 100% losses? Is it, you know, what part of their own personal balance sheet is it coming from? Because if this works for them, there's quite a lot more capital where that came from. And if this group of, of investors that sit at our table um, move forward with the with the strategy of impact investing, they are very catalytic for a space of of other um, people with uh, significant resources. Can I, can I just say too that I mean I think we've got a structural problem that 
for those of us who run nonprofits, quite often our customer is different than the constituents we serve. Our customers are quite often those donors who want, they ask that ridiculous over, I'm so with you, Jacob, it's just <laughs> maddening. Um, and we are, um, we are pulled in different directions and it totally distorts the marketplace, it's a disaster. And then I, I wish, I, I'm so with you and I feel like we should just sort of storm the gates and say we refuse to operate that way anymore. And I was really heartened a couple years ago when like Charity Navigator, GuideStar, BBBYs did this open letter to the field, sort of like let's bust the overhead myth. We know it's ridiculous, you would never ask anybody building their for-profit enterprise um, um, these questions, why do you do it to us? And it didn't get much traction. It was exactly the right message. Um, it's something that sort of, I think, tamps down on our ability to sort of execute against um, what we know how to execute against. And I just was a little disheartened that it didn't get more traction. You just hit on my favorite topic, rating, rating agencies. Yeah. <laughs> and Charity Navigator yeah. was founded by a disgruntled donor <laughs> with no experience in a sector, right? A $1.5 yeah. million dollar budget. By the way, he was taking 10% of their salary. So don't even, four, four <laughs> employees trying to measure the, trying yeah. to give rating over 8,000 organizations yeah, across America. True. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Or, and then you have another side of Give Well, who's trying to argue that a $10 bed net is a better investment than $150,000 we might spend on a university degree for child. They're both, could be quality investments. And yeah. um, I think the rating agencies is, is probably one of the biggest culprits. I mean, people go to these. We all do. And at least GuideStar is committed to simply being not, not judging, but yeah. a one of transparency, yeah. which is what we should all be held to is like, we have flaws. This is how we're spending our money. And let the person investing the money choose if it's the right way. Yeah. All right, thank you. So I'm going to let, I know we have a lot of questions. So um, let me open up to the floor. Yeah. So um, I have like 50 million, but I'll start with one. Uh, I've been having this conversation, interestingly, and I'm, I'm glad to hear it's on a higher and broader level. Um, but I'm hearing in the nonprofit world people bragging that all the money they're raising goes directly to program. And I've had arguments with people about it now. It's like, how do you think the programs get done? And so that's uh, that's one. And another, this very um, well off, um, very well to do woman whose husband is in head funds. She's volunteering to run this whole organizational um, effort and is looking down on those of us in the nonprofit who make $10,000 a month. <laughs> like how dare they make 10,000 a month and thinking that. And it's, so I think um, I'll leave this question here or comment. I, I think it's critical what you're saying as leaders in our field or from a different perch. Um, really, I um, make more effort to get this conversation restarted. If it didn't work a few years ago, um, not only are nonprofits put to a different and higher standard, um, but it's, it's completely an absurd way that we're judged in, in where no one else is. So I thank you for the conversation, and I, I ask that you try to expand it. I think it's incredibly it. damaging when organizations yeah, say, oh, our board covers this all. Right. It's, yeah. There's still donations, too. We're proud. Our annual report just came out this week. We show that 65% of our money goes into staff compensation. We, I don't need any more pencils and computers. I need doctors, nurses, psychologists, coaches, mentors. I need good people, chartered accountants, lawyers. That's who we need to run. And we're, we're, we came out with this. We don't know the impact yet that it'll have on us, but it's the truth. And then you call it overhead, you call it programs. I don't know. I mean, uh, um, one of your larger or one of your investors um, has, is committing a quarter million dollars a year to us for the last five years simply to, for um, HR, to build our HR department. And that's just, that's not sexy. It's not exciting. But God, is that, that's how you build real sustainability, right? I mean, that's, how, that's the backbone of a company. And um, we need more philanthropists, I think, who are taking a stand. Um, I was just with a young hedge fund manager today who just actually, along these lines, committed a half million dollars to us specifically for a vesting program for 14 of our top uh, talent around the company. Walk them in for five years. That's awesome. That's we can now. I can take. I can breathe and say, okay, I've got a five-year, some five-year time period to really sort of really plan, think about, and take a deep breath and try to do some awesome things with it. Yeah, I mean, I was talking to someone at breakfast today about the nonprofit space, at least from what I've seen in the last two years, and there isn't competition, but there isn't a whole lot of collaboration. 
I think everyone sort of just goes about their business. And if someone reaches out, they'll help you out. If there's something they're not eligible for, they'll kind of throw it out there and say, hey, this might be a fit for you. But there isn't this constant, hey, let's help each other. Or let's team up on this one thing. And let's push this initiative forward. Um, and in many ways, you wind up risking that time that you have called overhead and putting it towards something else that donors may not like. And so you wind up focusing your time on your programs and your efforts. It's such a mess. I mean, and the, latest, uh, <laughs> the latest canard is, and I wonder if you guys, it's the, the whole thing around scale, right? It's all about the volume-based approach. And I'm just like, well, you can be big and crappy, right? So I mean, the notion of we've got to get to scale, and we've got to fund, you know, get to 100,000 served or whatever, it's just these conversations are disconnected to the work um, that so many of us do. And it's really just tough. Um, and it would be nice, how do you create a forum, an honest, transparent conversation around how um, stuff really gets done. But I don't know that many fora, I don't see that many fora where those conversations really happen. I don't see them very often. Yeah. Uh, thanks for all your insights about the kind of funding and investment space. Do any of you guys sort of have any insights or any experiences with like crowdfunding or crowd investments and how that's changing stuff sort of beyond the large institutional donors or investors or kind of high net worth individuals and kind of the streets of the people? And if there's any more I've raised over $50,000 in peer-to-peer -peer investments. Um, that's how we got started. I literally started running triathlons and asking people for $5 and $10 donations. Um, the reality is that most donations come from individuals, um, and they come from people asking. So for us, it like accidentally happened that I was asking all these people who ultimately became our donor base when we started to segue and build an organization. Um, and I had been donating for two or three years in a row. When it became time to build our board, there was a group of people that I can go into and tap into and say, hey, you sort of already been involved with what we're doing. We want to take this to the next level. Can you get involved? Um, I think it's changed the like paradigm for how long it takes you to get started. Most people my age have come from wealth who are starting nonprofits. Um, I didn't. And there was still a platform and an avenue to get the seed capital that I needed, and then ultimately to get the bridge financing that we needed to take it to the next level. Um, so it's made it more accessible for the everyday person to be able to solve the problems that they really care about. I'm terrible at it. <laughs> yeah. we, can't, we have not figured it out. I have only one organization in my portfolio doing it. Um, it's worth mentioning because it's an interesting situation, but it's, a, it's a, called Liberty and Justice, and it's a, um, it's a women-owned uh, factory in Liberia. And they, um, uh, this gentleman who's really extraordinary, set up this factory several years ago, um, started hiring women to run it, and um, managed to get several different organizations to come in. They, they were tooled to build, to put together pants, men's trousers, um, trained these 300 women. And as they were about to just start, they had all the materials on site, Ebola broke out. So the factory shut, um, and you know, over the course of six months, they sort of are likely to shut down. You know, they they were really um, having a terrible time. What's interesting about the your question is that he now then he had all these. Um, well, first, it's worth mentioning that none of those women and none of their families died of Ebola because of the information they got from formalized employment. So just as a measure of impact, I felt pretty good about that. <laughs> Despite the loss of the money, we felt that that was probably the strongest impact we could have had. But he's now taken all that fabric, which is not really sellable and nothing you can do with it, and started to build school uniforms out of it. And he's like, how can I fund this school uniform project? Have you heard about this? So he's building school uniform. He's, he's creating it. He's hired back a bunch of the women to build the uniforms, and he's selling t-shirts called Uniform online. And the, 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 he's doing a, a Kickstarter um, sort of t-shirt sales, hoping to sell t-shirts for as much as $10,000 and as little as 10. Um, and hoping to kind of get the factory up and running because he's going through the, he has, they have to restart the due diligence process with um, Itochi and J. Crew and all these organizations, which takes 18 months. I think the one thing we've seen is that it is a really interesting tool. It is not a panacea. And it works best for people who already have really good social um, networks that they can tap. What we've seen is some social entrepreneurs who come from low resource settings actually think they're going to be able to go out and do these Kickstarter campaigns. It doesn't work because they don't have sort of the inherent built-in social media network. But if you have it, it is a great tool. something because uh, you have a background in medicine and uh, 
Uh, one of the things that people look for is outcomes analysis. And uh, if you can perhaps help people to understand, uh, because I think a lot of this is trying to explain to people who don't really understand what you're doing, uh, if you can show them where it goes and, and show it convincingly, then it seems to me that that's something that's very compelling for donors. Absolutely. <laughs> And I do see a lot of our um, earlier stage social entrepreneurs who are using technology tools and platforms like Salesforce and using other ways to sort of sweep up and sort of uh, keep data that allows them to sort it and, and crunch it and share it. Um, and um, I think that we are trying to demystify and make it less scary for people to think about measurement and evaluation. Like for a lot of people, they get scared. They're like, oh, wait, I just wanted to serve people. And like, what is all these like tricky things? But when you start to talk to people about how do you actually create a culture around performance and how are you executing, it makes it easier to engage in the conversation about how do you track what you're doing. And what you're measuring, by the way, I think is worth <coughs> noting, what you measure to measure impact in some of these, particularly in for profits, will evolve. And I think that's, well, it's true for both. So what you're measuring when you get started might not be what you're measuring down the road. So you might be measuring you know, how many kids come through your program, but then ultimately, over time, you're measuring the, you know, the course of their life and the change in it. But you can't measure that in the short term. You know, we're measuring right now the number of phone calls and the amount of money saved in these prisons by the population in, in Pigeon Lee. But over time, we'd like to show that those people get out and, and go back to jail less. You can't show that for a while. I, I think that's a very good point because most of us tend to focus on short-term goals and short-term profitability and short-term outcomes. And oftentimes, the real costs and the real outcomes are really much longer. Just a couple of cases. Okay. Sorry, John. Now, I was going to say a couple of resources. So there's a great book by Mario Marino called Leap of Reason, um, venture philanthropist um, who I think sort of sets out a nice framework about how do you think about these things, and a scholar at Harvard Business School called Al Noor Ibrahim that talks about how to think about what to measure depending on what type of organization you are. And I found that stuff very helpful. In our case, I mean, it's a long journey. It's 18, 20 years to get the child into university <coughs> or employment. And there's some huge wins along the way, keeping a child alive, keeping their mother alive, keeping them improving their literacy, it goes on and on. Um, but it's it sort of for us, and we started to, because it's such a um, high cost investment, we need to show people the return that these children who go through our program put back into society as opposed to the kids in our community, not in our program, that actually drain society. And th while we've extrapolated that they didn't begin to show it, we were, our, our oldest kids are only a few years out yet. Right. Um, but it's already remarkable, the difference. Um, and so looking through the economic lens, which helps us speak to sort of a lot of the financial world, which is our core funding base. Um, I do want to go back to just, and probably ending pretty soon, but just encouraging people to just think about the right questions. I share a story that happened six weeks ago with a family foundation that's been supporting for seven years. One of the sons who was in private equity just joined their board, um, family foundation, and uh, he said to me, um, so I looked at us, I was in there presenting at their board meeting, and he, I said, I have a question. I said, OK, he looked at the audit. said, I see you spent a million dollars on fundraising this year. I said, yeah. And that was the, he stopped there. I said, I'm sorry, dude. He said, that seems like a lot. As opposed to even asking me, what did I produce with that? And then asking, once you learned that it was over $6 million, why not ask him, why didn't you spend $2 million to produce, to potentially raise 12? And think of all the good work we can do. And I use that as a, just a good example of trying to, to um, hold the nonprofit stand sector to the same standards as the for-profit sector, which isn't that high, by the way. The bar's pretty low. <laughs> and you know, we hear about all the scandals and everything in the nonprofit sector. Let's not approach it. I mean, not every, in most organizations that they're doing really good work, whether they're hybrids, whether they're social enterprises, but nonprofits, microfinance, whatever, they really are. And don't approach them with this idea of it's a scam. They're misusing my money. They're, you know. Yeah, I'm pretty sure everyone up here could have found a more lucrative path. You know. <laughs> But I, one, one thing I thought was met, worth mentioning on your outcomes measurement is there's things called social impact bonds now. And they're trying very much to take the burden off of taxpayers and to say, we'll privatize it and we'll measure something and we'll show that we saved this much money by, by you know, anti-recidivism or taking some, some portion of society that's a taxpayer burden. What they can, because they're outcomes-based and they, they really have to measure and demonstrate what they're doing in order to pay back the bond, 
they only take binary outcomes. So they're only looking at, are you in jail or out of jail? Are you a pregnant teen or a non-pregnant teen? Did you graduate from high school or didn't you? They can't take any of the nuanced sort of beautiful work you're doing, which is, did, was this child loved? <laughs> did somebody watch it grow up and make sure that they got to the right place? That's fair. It's not a binary outcome, and anyone you know understands that. So I love the concept of trying to make these financial products. But I think ultimately, these are social hairballs that are very complicated to solve. And picking them apart is, a, is really the investment space that I try and create, bring my own investors to a comfort level of saying, 2x would be fantastic, exit, you know, because we're, we're dealing with something really difficult. Can I ask Jacob a question? I'm curious, now that you've reached a certain amount of scale, do your donors or funders, are they pushing you to do randomized control trials, or is that something you're putting forward? We're looking at it. We're not getting the pressure from our donor base. So we've now, I talk a lot about the type of investors I want. They're, they're sort of, they believe in us. They like what we're doing. Um, they're slightly more hands off. Um, I'm just sort of, which is which is great. It allows us to yeah, yeah, just because yeah. you've made a um, billion dollars betting on Apple, that doesn't mean you you know you care about how Apple runs its company. Right. They don't just because you you don't know how to solve global poverty just because you were successfully able to build up a company next and sell it. And I needed to find a donor base that could stick with us, allow us not to go to scale and spread out geographically and yeah. focus deep down. And yes, we're over 17 years. I've been doing this. It's a long time. Yeah. We can actually prove the models for it. Then, um, but to have that discipline, to, it's been very tough to say no. Yeah. And um, I could list a hundred things I've done wrong and learned. And I don't know. Interesting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much um, for speaking tonight. Um, we'll have time for one more question. You know, obviously, you're all these are all socially social missions with your organizations that. You know, in an ideal world, maybe um, government or the actual public policy sector would be able to address. And so maybe there's a gap because you know local government hasn't figured that out, or they don't have the capacity, or whatever. So I was just wondering how, or if your organizations are working in your respective areas with the local, municipal, state, national, whatever governments to try and facilitate something like knowledge transfer or capacity transfer. Um, if that's appropriate and how you're doing that. I guess we're in New York City, so we're local, and we are working with the city government. Um, the reality is that we can't solve this summer crisis with the philanthropic dollars that you need. In New York City, there's about 800,000 kids in any given school year that are either not on grade level or are low income and should be in some sort of enrichment program. A quality summer program is going to cost you about $2,000 a kid. So you're talking about a $1.6 billion investment here in New York City alone every single summer. I can't raise $1.6 billion. <laughs> These are some amazing people. I haven't seen them raise $1.6 billion yet yep. every year. Um, so it is some of those transitions will have to happen at a city level um, where funding will have to be reallocated. It sounds like a lot of money, but it's actually 5% of our public school budgets here. Um, this summer, for the first time, we're actually having kids who get credit for coming to our programs in the same way they would have gotten credit had they gone to a traditional summer school program. Mm -hmm. But it is, it's huge. You can't take on the, these problems, at least when there's a market, um, in this case, um, and not use that as an opportunity to leverage the organization. And I mean, for us, we have two customers. It's the donors and the schools. Um, the schools actually pay a fee, and so a lot of our work is performance driven on both sides. Yeah, look, I mean, the interesting, sort of the early iconic social entrepreneurial leaders, the hallmark of social entrepreneurship is like, Ugh, government is broken, we as citizens will come in and fix the market failure. But for a lot of folks, the government is the source of growth capital, right? So as a lot of these enterprises were trying to get to scale, they were bumping up against this lack of capital. So they sort of shifted and started to engage. And the Obama administration um, set up the historic White House Office of Social Innovation and Civic Participation. And I think has done a great job using the bully pulpit and using some levers around innovation funds, the Department of Education and Corporation for National and Community Service um, to sort of invest um, venture philanthropy dollars into some of these enterprises is doing a lot around social impact bonds, trying to bring in more impact investing dollars. So I think this administration has been hospitable um, to social entrepreneurial thinking and ways of doing. We'll see if it continues. I, I hope it will, um, because one of the interesting things about this space is it really is an alliance-based model of change, and it's sort of nonpartisan um, in, in, you know, 
in its purest form. It's about solving problems and sitting down at the table in an alliance-based uh, method. And so there's hope that government could be seen as a partner. Um, but I think these are really early days. We'll see if any of it sticks. All right. On that, on the on that last note about the cross-sector collaboration and the partnership, I think that that's where we also began. So, um, so I will ask everyone to thank our panelists. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.